the Seller Success Program here today uh, to answer questions on how to sell successfully. Um, I'll, I will prompt everybody to introduce themselves in just a minute. It looks like we have quite a few people in here. Um, and um, Marcy, we're probably ready to start recording, huh? Why don't we start and we'll get going. So once again, uh, welcome to the Seller Success Panel. Um, as I told you, my name is Brandon Johnson. I've been a seller on the platform for about five years in the script writing category. Um, I've had a very good experience working with buyers from all over the world. And um, in doing that, I have had a equally great experience working on community development here where I live in Chicago. And um, especially over the last year, um, being a part of great events like this that can reach people all over the world. Uh, with us today, we have a brilliant team of panelists from the um, uh, Seller Success Program, and um, I would like everybody to just briefly introduce themselves. Trisha, could we start with you? Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for putting this together and, um, and hosting us all today. My name is Trisha Diamond. I'm the Director of Customer Success for Fiverr. Great. And Rand? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Ran, and I'm Seller Success Team Lead at Fiverr. Chris? I'm, yep. Hi, everyone. And, and thanks, Brandon, for, for putting all this together. I'm Chris Banizak. Um, I'm a Seller Success Manager here at Fiverr. I work specifically with Fiverr, with Fiverr sellers in the music and audio and writing and translation categories. Awesome. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is also Brandon, just like our host, Brandon. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a seller success uh, manager here as well, and I work primarily with the uh, graphic and design vertical here at Fiverr. Very, very nice to be here. Great. Uh, yeah, it, it's incredible to have so many of you here because um, we, we want to have as many different sellers from as many different backgrounds um, be able to come to events like these and have their uh, views represented um, by people who are so intimately involved with how the platform is running. Um, I, I myself, as I said, I, uh, I have um, had a number of gigs in the script writing category. I, I mostly work with executives and production companies to um, punch up their slates of projects for licensing full sale of rights and distribution. And so being able to help establish a, a pipeline of those kinds of projects through Fiverr um, that will empower people to uh, take their project to the next level is something that's very important to me. And I think it's a, a reason why um, Fiverr particularly is one of the best aspects of how globalization is um, changing the world and helping so many people change their lives. Um, but with that comes a lot of responsibility of um, acting authentically and as altruistically as possible as a seller. So we have a number of questions here that we'd like to start with um, that will encompass a lot of ways that people can grow what they're doing on Fiverr and how they can engage meaningfully with other buyers. And from there, we will um, open things up later on for a Q&A. Uh, so as always, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A section. Um, if you put them in the chat section, they might get lost in translation. So just please feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A section and we'll try to cover as many as we can. So. Um, we would like to start with um, what is the best advice for getting noticed on Fiverr? Trisha, would you like to start? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I think first, if you're starting with the basics, is think about how you can distinguish yourself on the marketplace. It's a big marketplace, but what makes you uniquely you and let that shine through? So um, whether that's doing something as simple as using your photo on your gig images so that potential buyers can immediately put a face to the name um, or going into your description and through your profile and talking about your unique experience and why the service that you offer, you're qualified for. For example, Brandon, if you had asked me specifically, I would say to highlight some projects that you've worked on that are very notable, that, um, that folks by and large would recognize. Like think about the most important projects you've done and use that as a basis as to why you can do this work. But really what I think it all comes down to, again, it's just, just be you and let you shine through and you'll stand out. 
Mm -hmm. Would anybody else add to that? Yeah, and, and, and you know, to, to add to what Trisha had said, you know, and, and we could talk all day about gig optimization and, and you know, how to make a gig as, as great as it can possibly be. The one big thing for me um, really comes back to taking care of your buyers. Um, you know, I find that to be something that drives business. And, and one thing that is so evident, I think, Brandon, and, and you can vouch for this on Fiverr, is that momentum means a lot, right? You know, it is... Sometimes I, I compare Fiverr to like pushing a big boulder down a hill, right? It takes a lot of effort to get it going, but once it gets rolling, sometimes it, it really takes off. And, and the way to keep that momentum is to take care of the people you do get orders from. If you do get just one order this week, that's okay. You want to knock that order out of the park. You really want that buyer to be blown away because then they're going to come back. They're going to say great things. They're going to tell their friends. And then, you know, the next time they have business or someone they know has business, they're going to come back to you and, and that's going to, bring other people to your door as well. So I can't stress enough, you know, how important I think taking care of your buyers is. Mm -hmm. I, I would definitely uh, agree with that. I think when we, when we talk about getting noticed, I, I think we think about the categories pages, um, but think about all the things that your buyers will notice, right? Like what about your attention to detail? What about your revisions and updates and things like that? What about edits and, and um, subsequent deliveries and things like that? Like what, what can you develop throughout the entire order process that will make um, initial customers re repeat customers? Um, I think the, the, the two major sentiments that I've always followed is that when people are coming to freelancing sites, that many of them are tired or um, fatigued with dealing with, with company jargon and all that, and they, they want to work with an individual. They want to be hands-on or, or hands-off, but with a real person. And so like Trisha was saying, um, putting your best foot forward and just being your authentic self is, is really key in what Chris was saying about, um, you know, absolutely taking care of customers and um, buyers every step of the way is really important too. Um, because the, the quality of your work extends much past what people initially click on, like a logo or an image or something like that. So that, that leads us into the next question. What is quality on, on Fiverr? Uh, Brandon, what would you add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So just like you were saying, Brandon, quality, it, it extends a lot more than just that initial click on the gig. You know, quality on Fiverr, providing quality work isn't just making sure that the, the project that you're providing to your client is proficient, but it's the whole entire order. It's from the second that that buyer contacts you in that message, in that inbox, and making sure that you're asking the right questions, that you're acting engaged, that you're making sure that you're taking the steps to do the research to understand what exactly is the project that this client in my inbox needs me for, and how am I going to be able to produce that accordingly. And then once you do seal that deal, once you do get that buyer to go ahead and click that purchase, the job isn't over. You know, you want to make sure that you're keeping them updated with the work process. You don't just want to get their requirements, disappear for three days, and then deliver the work. You want to keep them updated. You want to keep them posted and make sure that that customer feels secure throughout the entirety of the order process that you're trying to work your best to provide, you know, whatever exactly they're ordering from you. So just keep in mind, it's not just providing, you know, a quality product, but it's providing an entire quality, like, customer service experience as a whole. Yeah, it, exactly. Would, would you, um, Ron, would you add anything to that? I think that Brandon uh, was uh, correct when saying that we need to think of the buyer as a journey. And therefore, I would probably, and I see it a lot of the times with sellers that they think or act upon quality uh, just in terms of the deliverable. So I think that the understanding that it's only part or only a friction of what determines a quality of, a, of an order is very, very important. So I would definitely, as a seller, I would definitely think of all the areas that need my attention to make sure that the quality is high, high notch. So it's the delivery, it's the communication, it's the level of trust and how comfortable the buyers feel with you. Um, all of those things that just make uh, the buyer understand that you're there for them. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a really interesting point. 
Um, and, and something that, you know, I really stress with all the sellers I work with, the personalization aspect of it. Um, you know, Brandon, you, you hit on a really good point that these buyers want to work with a person. They don't want to connect with a, a robot, right? They want to connect with somebody who understands them and understands their project and their company and, and that they're able to have an open, honest conversation with. You really have to view yourself as being a partner in these transactions with, with these buyers. It's not just, you know, an exchange of money for goods. It is that, of course, we all know it's that. But you, at the end of the day, are a partner in something that they care a lot about. And you have to invest um, your, yourself in their project um, to, to really get that level of success. Yeah, and I, I think with so many startups and individual projects and small and medium-sized businesses that come to Fiverr, um, as, as well as larger ones that have, you know, massive audiences with, with huge presence, they're really putting the future of their endeavors and their hopes in your hands. So, um, you know, act uh, uh, accordingly. Um, and, and with that, I think uh, a, a really good thing is to have your own protocol and, and I'm not saying regiment with, with yourself, but think about um, with so many sellers coming to this event um, as, as people who are looking to expand on what they have been doing, think about giving yourself an audit. You know, what, what facets of communication can you streamline? If, if you've worked with a, a hundred different buyers, you know, you know what people's expectations are going to be generally for different kinds of projects. So how can you how can you set up um, automated uh, or qu quick re responses and how can you set up um, what you can automate on the platform to then maximize the time that you're spending on that personalization? Because if you try to do that from start to finish for every single order, you're going to get inundated and overwhelmed. So you know, think about uh, how you can already anticipate the, the needs of your buyers before they even come to you so that the time you do spend with them is about building in that personalization, which takes us to our next question. Actually, Brandon, do you oh, mind? Yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you mind if I jump <laughs> I'm, in? I'm just rolling. Two little tips that, I, yeah. that I've actually learned from sellers that use Fiverr that can be really effective. Um, the first is, and I think this is brilliant. I see a lot of sellers, they ask a question, an optional question in their requirements that say like, tell me about you, about your business and your goals for this project. So without you even having to actively engage for that, the buyer is delivering that to you, which of course saves you time in personalizing anything that you need to. And even if you don't do that, it already makes them feel like, hey, this seller is here for me. Um, Another tip, and we've mentioned it lightly, but I see it popping up a little bit in chat, is to use those quick responses. Like Brandon said, if you've done 100 orders, you know what your customers are looking for. So as your very first message, set up a quick response that's like, mm -hmm. hey, thank you so much for your order. Just so you know, over the next X days, this is what you can expect the process to look like. This is what I'll be working on first, and this is when you'll hear from me next. Because if you set those expectations, um, even if you have too many, uh, not too many, but a lot of orders in queue and it's hard to manage it, at least your buyer knows when they will hear from you. Yeah, um, and sorry, go, go ahead, Ron, please. Can I add to that uh, one more important thing that I think that is, uh, I see it with a lot of sellers when they kind of reflect on their quality or try to kind of uh, think if they're, they give good quality service to their buyers. One thing is, sometimes missing and it's Q&A. So if you insert a Q&A into the processes of work and kind of think of if there's a problematic order and then what's the problem in it and if it adds up to other orders that you uh, previously delivered, this can paint, uh, ping uh, a certain aspect that you need to kind of uh, change or add to it or something like that. So it's kind of elevating the quality that you provide for sure. And, and, and even a smaller piece after that, I would say that in general communication, it's always good to thoughtfully end each message with a question uh, about the work or something that prompts the buyer to respond to you because keeping that engagement going um, keeps the project in their mind and it keeps the project going in, in a positive direction. Because ultimately, 
the, the more information you get from the buyer, the more you can over deliver. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and that goes both ways because if you, if you don't, let's just say you don't engage, right. If you're, if you're confident in your work and you know what you're doing, yeah. you can deliver an, an awesome work product, but, mm -hmm. but that will be the breadth of what you deliver. Right. If you engage more and you get a greater understanding, you can still deliver a very similar work product, but then the value add of that in the buyer, from the buyer's perspective is 300% is greater. Um, so always just don't be afraid of, of saying, you know, what do you think of this? Or um, what would you add? Um, how do you feel? Just having some sort of uh, emotional sensibility about what you're doing um, yeah. will go a long way. Would anybody else add to that? Um, I think that you touched upon a very uh, crucial point and maybe it refers to other questions that you have, but it's kind of uh, how to uh, not get offended about a certain uh, criticism or feedback that you receive from a buyer that can definitely help uh, saving an order. I don't know if this is part of the arsenal of questions that you have for us. But if not, then I can elaborate if it yeah. is can um, say later. Let's, well, we're, we're talking about it. So, so let's, let's address the idea of um, how, how do you, how can sellers best work with um, buyers where the three-step paradigm is firing on all cylinders? So people are familiar generally with uh, cheap, fast, easy, right? So yeah. if somebody wants something quickly, but they also want it to um, be really uh, outstanding, but they also don't want to pay that much for it, um, yeah. on, on any of those verticals, um, you can end up in a, a more tenuous situation. So as, as just a general thought, I would just say always communicate with a smile and just always take stock of what the underlying um, sentiments or ideas are within the messages that you're receiving and just try to cater towards um, the path of least resistance in, in that way. Um, what would you elaborate on, Ray? Um, so I think that uh, first maybe we should uh, help Marcy with the chat. Sorry about that because I see a lot of questions over the chat. People, if you can please put uh, place your questions in the Q&A instead of the chat, that will help us uh, tremendously. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to the discussion. Sorry about that. Um, so I think that um, being very personalized, and this is, uh, I'm familiar with it because I used to be a, a student. I used to write um, those uh, seminars and theses, and I used to have like very emotionally attached uh, relationship to what I write. And then comes back the professor and gives you a feedback or a criticism. So, and then you kind of take two steps back and you get confrontational, but after a, like after a period of time when you kind of let it sink and then you realize that maybe the professor was right. So I think that in terms of uh, um, buyer expectations, sellers should or can um, uh, take that approach in mind, not getting too, um, uh, emotional about what you deliver because at the end of the day you're here to uh, provide something that the buyer needs so even if the buyer have a concept that is uh, uh, let's think about it that the buyer has some kind of concept of what he wants or she wants from the delivery to be and if you realize that you are here to serve them I think that it can solve a lot of uh, problems along the way um, yeah, Ron, I, I think the the idea of expectation setting is so, yeah. so crucial um, to what we do, um, you know, as sellers in, in every category. You know, I was talking with a seller that I worked with yesterday and, and I explained to them, you know, if, if you've got someone who wants ice cream and, and you give them cake, it doesn't matter how good the cake is. It could be the best cake on earth, but if they wanted ice cream, right, they're, they're gonna be disappointed and there's gonna be an issue there. So we really wanna make sure um, that everything we do is geared towards making sure 
we understand what the buyers want. And, and I understand sometimes that's difficult. It is, you know, there's sometimes that, that it's like pulling teeth to try and get a buyer to tell you what they need. And you've got to use every tool at your disposal, whether it's those requirement sections, whether it's the gig description, whether it's a gig video, whether it's sometimes just putting a pause on a conversation and saying, Hey, I want to give you the product you want. Help me understand. You know, I, I want you to be happy. I'm struggling here. Help me understand. You can't be afraid to have that level of transparency with these, these buyers. Um, because again, if, if they want ice cream, we want to give them ice cream. <laughs> and one final comment on that, which by the way, Chris, that is the best analogy. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> but is to remember that a buyer is generally coming to you because you're an expert in your field and they're not necessarily an expert. And especially if you're dealing with complex projects, like, I mean, all of our projects can be complex, but imagine if you're creating a mobile app to somebody like me who has never written a line of code in her life, um, I'm going to need a lot more handholding and a lot more understanding of the process, like not just the deliverable, but why is the deliverable this way? Like, what are my limitations? And setting, again, like everybody said, setting expectations is key. Yeah, definitely. And, and as, as a seller, I, I would say, don't be afraid to send a message that says, you know, based on everything we've been talking about, here's A, B, C, X, Y, Z. This is my understanding of it. And if you have anything else you want to put in, the time is now, you know, just be, take ownership of what you're doing, but then also use that ownership as your rudder to move things in the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, setting expectations is something that um, we often talk about all the time in these kinds of events, but that's, that's probably the defining um, molecule or, or, or quality that will help um, orders go in the right way or the, the wrong way. But beyond their orders, there are uh, gigs. So the next question is, what are some proactive steps you can take to sell more gigs? Brandon, what would you add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of being proactive, in terms of trying to sell more gigs, so first things first, you want to think about what services are you proficient in? Because you can, one, focus on you know scaling the gigs that you already have, but you can also focus on how else can I expand my offerings to my clients. And that's going to help you reach a potentially larger, you know, audience on the platform. For example, let's say that you are a logo designer, you know that the buyers that are going to be coming to you are looking to, you know, potentially start a brand or a business or something of that nature. If someone is looking for a logo, chances are they're probably also going to need some social media designs. They're probably also going to need some stationary designs, like some business cards or something like that. Keep in mind what the needs of your client is and then think about what else can you offer along with your main kind of service that you're providing to really expand your services as a whole and also expand the revenue that you can potentially be getting. Not only that, the more services that you're offering, the more searches that you're going to show up in. So that's more impressions for you and just generally scaling your business upwards. So just, you know, kind of keep in mind what exactly you can offer to your clients. What are your clients asking for and what do you believe you're proficient in enough to, you know, obviously kind of sell on the marketplace. Of course, there's other ways to be proactive as well to look for more sales. For instance, word of mouth is honestly probably one of the best marketing tactics you can do. If you have satisfied buyers, you let them know, listen, I'm here for all of your resume writing needs or logo design needs or whatever service you're providing whenever you need them again. You know, create that relationship with your buyer. You want to have returning customers and you want to let them know that, listen, if you have a friend or a friend of a friend that also needs a logo, refer them to me. At the end of the day, natural word of mouth marketing is one of the best tactics that you can implement on the platform. Of course, there's also social media promotion as well. If you're active on social media promotion, Fiverr gives you the ability to, you know, share a link to your profile. You can also create a badge that links to your profile if you happen to have a website or something of the sorts. So, you know, there's multiple ways to really be proactive and look to scale your business on the platform. Um, you just kind of have to go for it. Great. Would anybody else add to that? Yeah, I think that uh, a secret that, may, that many sellers do not know, under the tab more in your seller profile, you can find buyer requests. Buyer requests is the most important thing when you are a beginner because you can just drive traffic to your gigs proactively. So I think that this is a, a great idea 
to make sure to get familiar, uh, familiarized with more buyers and uh, just drive traffic to it. But adding to what uh, Brandon said, which is very, very important, I think that it's also important for freelancers to kind of think about themselves as businesses. And all of what Brandon mentioned is kind of a business approach to how you engage with uh, clients. Uh, having that in mind, like yourself as a business, utilizing social media, uh, word of mouth, make sure that you have like a portfolio, if, specifically if it's video and animation or graphics and design, all of those things that kind of add up into a business that can also help for sure. Yeah, I, I would add to that by saying, think about ways. Here's, here's two things I would think of as a, a seller to encourage word of mouth if you understand the pipeline of your project. So as somebody who writes scripts, right, that's going to, those scripts are going to go in a hundred different directions across the platform, right? So if I know of other sellers who are doing things that are totally different than what I provide, if I can connect to them and refer them for projects, when, when those sellers get uh, incoming projects that are going to require a wealth of different uh, facets in order to get a, um, a uh, explainer video or um, a video for a website created, they'll then come back to me theoretically for script writing work, right? Um, and that's a way to grow an ecosystem around what you're doing. In the same way, I would say, think about what you could do um, on a consultancy basis almost outside of what you do um, with, your, um, with your more technical skills on the platform. What can you do with your soft skills to grow your business? And what, what I mean by that is, if, if people want to understand storytelling better, how can I work with them in a development capacity to help shape their ideas on how they think about storytelling, right? If you're in design, um, what kind of consultancy can you give for companies who don't know anything about design, but they have products and services that are gonna, that are gonna need uniform branding? How can you, um, how can you have a gig that gets you paid for a lot of what you're already doing for, for free, which you can always still do for free in your active orders for your more technical work, but how can you, um, how can you create gigs for companies that are going to want uh, more of a hands-on informational process on how they can grow their brand? Um, and those are two things that I think will continue to expand the more that the Fiverr platform grows. Um, and a big way that uh, Fiverr has been growing over the last few years is, is Fiverr Pro. Um, I had been on the platform for a number of years when Fiverr Pro debuted, and I was um, very quick to try to get engaged with that because it was, it was clear that that was going to be the way forward. And I think um, as the platform has continued to grow, and um, especially the growth over the last year, um, I, I think that that's more true than ever. So there are a lot of questions about Fiverr Pro. Um, who is a good fit and what can people expect to be different about the experience as a seller? Trisha, would you like to start? Yeah, was that for me and I missed it? I Sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't specify yeah. anybody, but um, yeah, there are yeah. many questions about Fiverr Pro. So if we could just talk a little bit about what that is, how people can get involved, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, just starting at the basics. So Gosh, I don't even know where to start. So Fiverr Pro, it's a, it's a part of Fiverr where to receive this pro badge, there is like an application process. So talking about where to start is you can actually go on fiverr.com slash pro and you can scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and click through to the application. This is, um, this is a really good avenue for folks that have like a very robust experience like freelancing or within their agency. Um, the application to join pro if you're selling on Fiverr already, that's great, and it and it's and it can be helpful, but that's not necessarily what is needed. It's like what we're really looking for when we look for Fiverr Pro sellers is um, is their experience in their industry. Uh, back in the beginning, I talked about highlighting notable projects that you've worked on. Like this is a great place to showcase that. Um, 
you know, and as far as the experience, like it can be different, but like, I'm a big believer in that, uh, in the variety of things that are on Fiverr and that there is a buyer for every type of seller, whether it's in Fiverr Pro or not, there's always going to be in match. Generally, we do see like some higher budget projects and some bigger companies that are using Fiverr Pro, but vice versa as well. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, there, are, there are definitely people who understand just the basic sentiment of you get what you pay for. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really true in every facet of life. Um, when I started on Fiverr, you could send cost, custom offers, but Fiverr Pro wasn't a thing. And if, if you looked at the breadth of sellers on the platform, um, costs skewed lower. And the way I always looked at things was um, kind of two, two things. If, if you love what you do, you do it for free. And that if, if I was going to take on Fiverr as much as I have, then this would be an incredible opportunity to just have um, times at, at that, right? If, if I were to go around um, continuing to build up a portfolio of commercial clients in Chicago or flying to LA or New York to um, work on series and feature projects, that was gonna take a hundred lifetimes to have the reach that I've had in just a few years with Fiverr, right? So with that, um, I can tell you that in um, working with so many different projects and people, uh, there are people who are definitely interested in paying more. Um, and usually those are the people who are willing to uh, be hands off and understand that you're the expert, right? Like that's why they came to the platform and paid a higher premium. Uh, would anybody else care to add to the nature of uh, Fiverr Pro and how to get involved? No, right. I, think, I think Trisha added all up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just, you know, put your best projects together, put your best fit, foot forward, uh, uh, apply, and um, as much as it's about quality of work, it's about engagement uh, with buyers and, and the level of service that you provide. So really, um, to think of it in, in a very simple way, everything that we've talked about today is a funnel into what makes Fiverr Pro what, what it is. Um, and that's going to continue as uh, freelancers continue to come on to the platform, more and more competitive talent comes forward and freelance, the freelance marketplace in the gig economy continues to change. So um, over the next few years, especially considering how much fiber has grown over the last few years, um, what can sellers expect and how can people uh, prepare to stay competitive in the marketplace? Uh, Chris, would you like to add to that? Yeah, look, I, I think... You know, I, you raise a, an interesting point, Brandon. The last eight months has obviously radically shifted how the uh, the world works. And, you know, here at Fiverr, obviously, we predicted a, a move towards digital services and, and companies filling their, their gaps and, and their needs in this way. Obviously, it's happened, I think, even quicker than we anticipated. Um, so I, I think as we continue and the world continues to progress in that direction, we have to be prepared to stay competitive by staying professional, right? I, I think that's really at the forefront of this because digital services now aren't just going to be your mom and pop, you know, like they were maybe 10 years ago. This is big time organizations and, and companies in, from all walks of life in every industry. Um, to, to Trisha's original point that started this whole thing, we have to stand out from the crowd. We have to be able to say, look, this is what makes me different. This is why you should pay me to do this service. These are my qualifications. And, and we've got to look and feel professional because that's what organizations and, and companies are going to look like um, and, and look for as things get so much more competitive on both the buyer and seller side. Um, we've got to find a way to stand out. So I can't stress enough the idea of making sure your gig um, to your point, is it's a business. It's a business. It's got to look professional. The imagery's got to be professional. The description's got to look professional. If you need help, find it. You know, if you're not the best writer, find a proofreader. Find an editor. Help get their help to 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 really polish it. I, I think that's how you're going to stay competitive going forward. Is conveying yourself as as a true professional and and showing off what you bring to the table. Okay. I may add to that or maybe take like another angle on it. One thing that I'm hearing a lot from folks, especially over the last eight months as the world has 
really radically changed is what's trending on Fiverr? What should I be selling on Fiverr now in light of this? So first, I, I will tell you what's trending and then I'll give you my advice, which we're seeing a lot of like this digital transformation from offline to online, you know, seeing businesses that purely operate it like in their local communities, trying to figure out now how they can operate online, like either even still locally or globally. Um, but the thing that I would take with that and that I always say when people ask me what's trending, what type of gig should I open is to reflect back on yourself and it's like, what are you good at? If you are a fantastic designer and you make beautiful illustrations, but you don't know about creating WordPress websites, I wouldn't say like, hey, open up a gig tomorrow and figure it out as you go. Like, of course you can take the time to train and educate and learn, but think about what you're so good at and how that can apply online. Like if you're this amazing illustrator, why not offer to do social media illustrations that people could use on their Instagram and their Facebook instead of going off to a direction you're not comfortable in. Because if, as long as you accept, like, as Chris said, present, present yourself professionally, but then also excel in what you're delivering, you're going to do great. Yeah. Yeah, I would, um, I would say that one thing that's become abundantly clear over the last eight months is that there is now no line between what has been considered conventional business and what people are doing on Fiverr right now. So uh, what's important is that everybody is, is here today um, and, you know, already paving the path forward. And the sentiment has always been, if you want uh, an orchard of beautiful tall trees, the best time to plant them was 10 or 20 years ago. So the fact that you're already here and you're already taking the step to be on the you know, right side of, of, of history, arguably, of how business is going to go. Um, this is, this is really important. So with that, uh, I would, I would definitely echo, um, you know, uh, practice what you preach and, and do what you know. Uh, and if there are ways that you can expand on what you're doing, learn a little bit here, here and there and continue to evolve your presence and, uh, put out more services that are authentically you. Um, like we've been saying all morning, you know, you're going to have a much larger presence on the platform. You're going to get more impressions, more clicks, and your, the, the business of you is going to grow. So with that, um, would you guys like to dive into a little Q&A? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I have a feeling everyone is waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Hannah says, I love that there is an option to see buyer requests. Are there any tips you have when putting in an offer? Um, maybe I start with that one. Um, yeah. uh, I try to mostly just do custom offers and that's not to upsell, but I try to always do custom offers because it helps the entire process feel more personalized. So I can write in exactly what the work product is before the order even starts. Um, because then that's, that's an initial outline of what the expectations are. Um, that's a way of, of helping set expectations. Um, and uh, in terms of offers, I would just say, I mean, it kind of echoes what I just said, but just be very direct and be very specific. Um, because the more that you communicate um, about what the project is, um, then that's another way that you're authentically communicating and building rapport and um, a, a tether of kindness between you and your buyer. Uh, when it comes to the monetary amount, I would say, you know, really just charge what you think you're worth. Um, every project is different. And even though you have packages, um, packages are a great way in, in that, um, you know, Fiverr uh, is an, is an expansion of what Amazon provides, right? It's like a one-click experience where people can engage with you automatically and get work started. Fiverr is an expansion of that because they're dealing directly with a real human being at the other end of the line, right? Um, but even if a project is indicative of what your standard package would be, um, look at it critically and, and think about the time involved and, and don't be afraid to upsell because there are there are people out there who are willing to pay for quality. And um, the, the power of Fiverr is that uh, what you make is ultimately up to your discretion. Uh, then as a seller with revisions, that's kind of a tough one um, because you want to show that 
uh, you're willing to work and make sure that there's a path of least resistance and that it's a frictionless process to get to a um, end result that your buyer is really happy with. Um, but it comes down to the seller and the gigs, right? So if you're building an, if you are building an entire website, there are sometimes technical difficulties when doing events. Did you know that? Um, when you, if, if you're doing an entire website start to finish, um, that's a lot of work. So, um, you know, think about what those revisions are. And then as we've discussed all, all morning, have, have protocol in, in place and uh, align expectations for what each revision step is um, because you don't want to get caught in, in, a, in a cyclical nature of, well, this needs to be changed. Well, this needs to be changed. You know, uh, I, I had mentioned earlier the idea of sending a message that states the work product that has transpired and what the expectation is. You can do that for each set of re revisions. Um, so that's how I try to handle things. Um, would anybody else add to that for custom offers? So uh, first of all, you handled that all so brilliantly, Brandon. Thank you so much for making our job easy. Uh, but one thing I would like to add from revisions to give my perspective as a buyer on the platform, because I, I buy on Fiverr a lot, uh, which hopefully is not a surprise, but I am always asking my custom offers, like, please build in revisions and charge me for them. But very rarely do I use them. But what I like as a buyer is knowing that I have the option there. For example, if I'm having a video edit it and like I see the final cut and I'm like, you know, actually, I want to change that now that I see it all together. I like having that flexibility and I'm willing to pay for it. And I believe that most buyers really are as well. Great. Excellent advice. Next question. Uh, should I have one really strong gig or multiple gigs for the same category? Are there advantages to both? Um, I, I would say proliferate out what, what you can do. Um, but category to category, what would you all add, add to that? Yeah, so uh, I'll jump in here because it's a really common question I get, especially from the voiceover artists I work with, right? Because there, there's so many different niches in terms of is it more beneficial to have uh, multiple gigs? Should I just have one gig? What, what's the best option? And, and there's not an easy answer. So I apologize that there's not a, a black and white here. But the way I put it is this, we, we have to think about you know, obviously getting more eyes on you is a great thing. Obviously more visibility is great. But going back to what I said earlier in the panel about momentum, we want to make sure that we kind of pile up that momentum. So what we don't want to do is compete against ourselves. We want to make sure that every gig we have is truly a distinct service on both sides of it. As the seller, you have to think, is this something that I handle differently? Is it something maybe I'm gonna price differently? Is it something that takes a different time commitment from my other projects? If so, it probably is the type of thing we wanna have as a, as a separate gig. But we also wanna think about from the buyer's perspective, right? About how is the buyer treating this? You know, is the buyer searching with different keywords? Are they, using a different lens when they're searching for that type of work. For my voiceover artist, and, and I'm gonna put it in terms familiar for the, the sellers I work with, you know, every day, we, you know, obviously you need voiceover work for a ton of different projects, right? Commercials and e-learnings and all of those types of things. A lot of it, it's the same thing, right? A lot of it's reading words off a page, but think about audiobooks as a different project, right? An audiobook is still just reading words off a page. But as a seller, it's going to be something radically different for you. It's a different time commitment. It's a different type of effort. And on the buyer side, they're going to use different words. They're going to use audiobook specific terms to search for that service. That's the same type of lens you have to have, regardless of what vertical you're in, is does this service stand alone as its own kind of distinct service? Um, so that, that's the advice I tend to give on, on this question, because it's a really common question. Yeah, I, I would add to that by saying, um, if, if you have a number of orders, you can kind of look at the trends and the tendencies of what mm -hmm. people are asking you for, right? So if you have 25 orders, and of course, this is a microcosm of such a thing. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have 25, if there are five different um, ki kinds of requests that people make, potentially those are five different gigs in the future that you can make. And if there's 12 or 15 of them that lean in one direction, maybe definitely make that a, a, a different gig. So I would just look at the kinds of work that you have been getting and think about how in the future you could proliferate that out into its own thing. Um, let's see, what is the next question here? 
once you have some reviews and regular clients, what's the most effective paid external advertising service? Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, are, are there optics or analytics on that? Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, we don't have exact analytics that we can share, especially since this is coming from platforms that are off of Fiverr. But I can tell you qualitatively from the sellers that I've worked with over the years, um, in general, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn tend to be more popular and they see the more success from that, uh, from Google. And there might actually be limitations with Google ads. No? We are not allowed. No. Uh, the terms of service specifically yeah, refer terms to service no. campaigns as something that is uh, banned for sellers. So there we go. It's a good yeah. thing I have my team here, but I do get a lot of good feedback from sellers that use like Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads, less so about like YouTube or other platforms. Yeah, yeah the, the best thing you can do for yourself is just putting out incredible work. <laughs> like I, I think um, it's, it's sort of a cheeky answer, but the reality is that that will that will increase your presence on the platform. And that's an incredible marketing tool, right? Um, and then beyond that, you know, there are many different services that can be tried, so. Um, I always say business brings business on Fiverr. It goes back to the Boulder analogy that Chris used earlier. It's a little bit to get started, but as you grow and you grow a reputation and your customers are super satisfied, this will help your gig be seen more. This will help folks just find you and you'll have returning customers as well. Um, next question, is it recommended to update the title and keywords of the gig from time to time, or does that negatively affect the rank of the gig? Um, yeah, so using keywords in your descriptions and, and titles is, is a huge way to help boost your gigs. Um, would anybody like to address that? Yeah, of course, I can touch on that. Um, sorry, Trisha. Uh, so, yeah, no, um, there, there is somewhat of a, of a misconception of some hesitation when it comes to editing, you know, the titles on the gigs or, you know, the gig images or the tags. When it comes down to it, your placement on search, I mean, amongst many other factors, of course, your customer satisfaction being the main one, um, your SEO, you know, the, the keywords that you're using in your title and your tags and even the metadata in your description are really going to play a big part in what kind of search queries your gig is going to show up in. So we strongly suggest that if you believe that there are more relevant keywords that you can use to better describe your service in your title or in your tags, use that. Go ahead and play around with the title. Go ahead and see, you know, which of these keywords is bringing me the most traffic on the platform. There's no, nothing is going to happen to your gig. It's not going to like immediately derank or anything. I know some people are really hesitant about that. We urge you to experiment with your gigs, to play around with your gigs, to see what works best for your business, you know, because at the end of the day, those keywords are really going to determine when a buyer goes to that search bar and types in whatever relevant keyword, is your gig going to show up or not. Another thing to really keep in mind as well is you want to try to use as many keywords as possible. And one common mistake that a lot of sellers make is that they kind of latch on to like two or three relevant keywords and they just start repeating them in their title and their tags. One thing to really keep in mind is that the point of the tags is to give you additional ability to add more relevant keywords to your gigs overall metadata. So you want to make sure that you're not using keywords in your tags that are the same as your title because then you're defeating the purpose of it. Use those tags to add even more additional keywords, key phrases to help your gig potentially reach a wider audience. But yeah, just to kind of generalize that, uh, you should never feel hesitant to edit your title, to edit your tags, you know, play around with it, see what brings you the most impressions, take a look at your analytics and see what exactly is working for you SEO wise. Yeah, Brandon, I'm actually going to use this opportunity for a shameless plug for um, our, our gig optimization webinar that we ran, um, you know, a handful of months ago at this point, because I've seen a bunch of questions in the chat that are, are specific on optimization. And obviously, we've got five minutes left here, and, and we, we're doing our best to get to as many questions as we can. So I'm going to go ahead in the chat and just send a link to a, a YouTube recording that our team hosted, um, you know, maybe six, six, seven months ago all about gig optimization. It goes over every single aspect of the gig from the title to the imagery, to the pricing, to the description, all of it. And it talks about what are the best practices? What, what are the tips and tricks that the best sellers on Fiverr are using to, to try and be successful? So I'm gonna share that link um, with everybody in the chat. 
So everyone here can watch it at their leisure and, and apply it to their own gigs. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I, done with my uh, shameless plug now. Yeah, and there's um, there's also a uh, Fiverr Learn course, successful selling tips or something like that. That's um, that's a fantastic resource that's that's free and it walks through many different ways that you can build out your gigs and descriptions and profile images and, and things like that. Uh, as a seller, I've been timid in the past about change because the idea is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But this is a very dynamic and fluid platform where you can make changes and you can also change things back. It's uh, it's a really cool form of reality where you sort of control your destiny more than ever. So don't be afraid of trying things out, trying different ideas because you're only going to be rewarded for taking risks that pay out. And if you find that something isn't effective for you, you can always change. So um, let's try to get through like a couple other things. Uh, Chris, can you send the link again? Because people said yeah, that they missed it. I know it, it scrolls up here. Yeah. I'm also adding the link to the Fiverr Learn course. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, is it recommend, or I'm uh, sorry, we just did that. When and how often do you recommend raising or lowering prices? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice issue to discuss. Um, should I go first, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So pricing is, I, to be honest, the, the best thing that I can do is send uh, a YouTube um, uh, link, if we are already uh, talking about links, about how to price your services by uh, the famous scary blogger. Uh, I'll find the link right away. But I think that in terms of pricing, it's very, very important to kind of not sell yourself short, but not be over expensive. So you always want to kind of uh, uh, feel the water or test the water in terms of the marketplace, see what mm -hmm. people or how your competition um, um, price their services and kind of accommodate yourself towards that. So uh, this is one. The second uh, advice that I have, if it's a, a relatively new gig that wasn't converting that much, don't go, uh, so not don't, uh, I won't say what you don't need to do. I would say what you need to do is kind of think of the price as uh, something that can drive traffic to your gig. So obviously if it's a new gig, you want to go on the low ranges of what you uh, wanted to uh, price your services at rather than the higher ranges of it. So you need to kind of play around with it. Obviously after the gig is starting to convert and you're, you're getting good experience with uh, what you uh, offer and uh, prospects can see that you're an actual expert in what you do because of the testimonials, because of the rankings, then you can think of maybe changing the price a bit. I wouldn't go too drastically because you also need to understand that this can uh, probably shift traffic off your gig um, and maybe also adding to the service a bit more to kind of uh, showcase or justify a price increase. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll send the link in two seconds. Sorry for that. And I have just a few questions that I always tell sellers to ask themselves when it comes to pricing. First, think about how long the job takes you and how much money you'd like to make per hour and put those together for the price of the gig. Second, mm -hmm. as Ron said, look at what your competition is doing on Fiverr. But third, also look at what this service costs outside of Fiverr. And considering all of those factors, you can really kind of intelligently come up with a price. And the one thing that I would suggest, if you are raising your prices, make sure that the, the value for money, basically, for the gig remains the same. So if you're charging more, make sure the buyer is, is getting a relatively the same value. So um, get this. Every Sorry. <laughs> oh, that was from the video, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Those are perfect points. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I could add an, anything more to that. Um, so look at, look at what else is happening across the marketplace. Um, think of it as an equation of how long something will take you and what your hour, hourly rate is. And then what I, would, what I would add to that is add in 10 to 20% of contingency perhaps for re revisions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, you, if you do those things and keep an eye on what your services cost off platform, maybe how you could be a little more competitive than, than that, 
you should be able to find a, a sweet spot. And the magic of that is if, if we're all doing that as, as sellers, then the, the quality of what we're all doing on the platform is going to naturally rise. So um, the onus is really on us to charge what we feel we're, we're worth um, for the high quality over delivering work that we're putting out. Um, so I, I think that wraps up the time that we have here. Uh, I want to thank our, our panelists for being here especially and um, giving such incredible advice and, and expertise because we're all, we're all looking to do more and, and do better and do greater things every day. Um, we wouldn't be here if, if we didn't feel compelled um, to be our best selves and, and do the best work we can on Fiverr and in life in general. And um, a especially big thanks to everybody who came today um, because this one, one thing that I've seen over and over over the course of the time that I've been on the platform is that Fiverr is a pretty rare company and that they really do understand that their marketplace and the sellers and the, and the buyers, but really almost the, the sellers in the marketplace, those are the people that are going to drive the success of everything that's going on. Um, and that's, that's very clear from um, how hands-on and willing they are to engage and do events like these. Uh, to inviting uh, sellers to the New York I IPO, to having community development groups all over the country in the United States and all over the world. Um, so being able to have these events is an absolute blessing. And if the last year has taught us anything, it's that we need more of them and that um, this is a way that we can create the best stride of globalization um, that marketplaces all over the world have seen in, in a long, long time. So thank you to everyone. Um, hopefully we can have some kind of follow up here. Uh, but otherwise, have a beautiful day. And thank you so much for coming. Um, oh, and uh, one last shameless plug. Events.fiverr.com is the best place to find future events like these, um, where we can have open conversations about the things that matter most to us. So events.fiverr.com. And um, we'll see you all real soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye.